And when you hear it, it may sound like it's too good to be true. It may sound like that it's not true. But let me tell you that wherever Paul preached this gospel, two things happened. One, people were radically born again and transformed. Amen? And two, the religious people hated it and they stirred up strife. And accompanying the message of grace was a spirit of strife and, and, and confusion. And so I declare over your life today that the enemy won't confuse you. But the gospel, which is too good to be true, because it is so good, would touch your heart and transform the way that you live. I have at home three pots filled with rhubarb. Does anybody here love rhubarb? Uh, uh, probably all the older people. <laughs> Let me warn you, don't eat the leaves because it'll kill you. But the stalk is really good. And I love rhubarb and apple pie with cream and ice cream and custard with liberal doses. And uh, you take that, that sort of thing before you go on the 20-day fast. It will sustain you. <laughs> it was the food that Elijah ate. And so I've got three pots and two of them... I didn't really prepare the ground. I can't remember what I did when I may have just had a little bit of soil. So I, I grabbed some cheap soil that was hard and uh, I put the rhubarb in the soil. The pots weren't that great. And as you can imagine, I've watered them since and the sun's come down, but I haven't had the heart or the time or the inclination to, to dig them up and fix them up properly. The third one I got was a wonderful rhubarb plant and I got an amazing pot and put the best soil in and put all sorts of sea salt and all wonderful things. And of course, the last one has grown and it's, it's, it's born amazing uh, rhubarb and the first two look like they're ready to die. Now here's the thing, how we are established in our faith at the very beginning is so important. Our position in Christ has to be understood for our lives to flourish and grow. And many Christians are like the first two rhubarb plants that I've had. They water, they, they go to church, they read their Bible, they do all the things that Christians should do, but there's something missing from their foundation. They actually don't understand the gospel. Yeah. And so they've got born again. It's not they're not born again, but it's like they only got part of the gospel. They're not quite sure what Jesus did and how God now sees them. There are a number of things that you've got to get right when you first begin your walk with the Lord. And if you haven't got them right, it's not too late. I was born again for probably 30, 30 to 35 years before I truly understood the gospel. There was a lot of watering, a lot of sun, but not a lot of fruit. As I've told you before, I used to get born again every week. It was great for the statistics of the church, but not great for my heart. So 50 people got born again in the year, and I was that person 50 times. And so, so that's not a great start. There's not a lot of fruit in that sort of lifestyle. Insecurity in our faith leads to lack of fruitfulness. Security in our faith leads to a lifestyle of victory and overcoming. So I'm going to share some things to, to you today that are from the Word of God. They're not Andrew's gospel. This is the gospel that Paul the Apostle preached with power. Amen? Come on, church. And it's going to lead to freedom. You say, well, I already know the gospel. Well, I, I, I thank you for that, and I'm going to share it again because you need to hear it again until you start bearing fruit that proves you really do know the gospel. Until you absolutely are, are, are just so consumed with the gospel and the freedom that it brings. I am still learning the power of the gospel. I'm still facing errors in, in my life that, have, that has either orphan-like mentality or else the errors of condemnation that I need to be free from. This is a journey that we go from grace to grace, faith to faith. Yeah. Amen. And so are you ready today to learn about your position in Christ? So you ready? Cool, cool, cool. So a number of things that you need to ask yourself. 
Every, every human needs to ask themselves these questions. How does God see me? Well, that depends. How does God see me? The next thing you need to ask yourself is, how does the devil respond to how God sees me? And thirdly, what am I going to do about how God sees me? If you get those three things right, you are going to have an incredibly fruitful and productive walk with the Lord. How does God see me? How does the, God, how does the devil respond to how God sees me? And thirdly, what am I going to do now about how God sees me? Pastor Dean shared last week about the covenants and it's so important to understand the covenants and he mentioned there were seven co covenants and, and that's true. And they give us insight into the way to how God sees people and how God responds to people. God's the same God right through the Bible but he responds to people according to the covenant. Pastor Dean shared that and it's so powerful. And I want to just highlight three covenants as we walk into this whole story because it sets us up for what I'm going to share. Under the Abrahamic covenant, God's people qualified to be blessed by God based on their pedigree. So they qualified based on their pedigree. In other words, if you belong to Adam, Abraham's family, you were blessed. It didn't matter how you behaved. You could be as naughty as you like. But as long as you were Abraham's son, Isaac or Jacob, you read the story. They were naughty at times. They missed God's will. They did things that were wrong. But God blessed them based on their pedigree. They qualified based on pedigree. Then we move to the Mosaic Covenant and it changes because... God's people didn't want to relate to God based out of his goodness, but out of their performance. So God changes the way he relates and sees people. So now he's not based on pedigree, but he's qualifying them based on their performance. Abrahamic, pedigree, mosaic is performance. So in other words, if you behave right, if you obey the commands, if you do what is right, I'll bless you. And if you don't obey the commands, if you don't perform, then you'll fall under the curse. Yikes. But under Christ's covenant, those that believe in Jesus qualify based on our position in him. Yeah. So we've got pedigree, performance, and now our position. Yeah. That's the change of the covenants that one was out of pedigree, one was out of performance, and the third one, which is the covenant that now God sees you and I through, it's all based around this one thing. Are you positioned in Christ Jesus? Good. Jesus, who has the perfect pedigree and the perfect performance measured up for us. He qualified as the one with the best pedigree. Yes, the son of the living God. With the perfect performance, he never, ever did anything wrong. He was holy and pure. He learned obedience by the things he suffered. He measured up for us. He cut a covenant on our behalf. And now when we believe in him, when we put our faith in him, we enter into a covenant with God based on one thing, not our pedigree, not your family, not, it doesn't matter who you're raised under, it doesn't matter how many generational curses you have or, or your father was an axe murderer or an alcoholic or your mother had four heads or whatever it might be, she came from cheap side or rich side, your, ped, your, your pedigree does not matter. It doesn't matter if your dad was born again or wasn't born again. You don't get to heaven because your dad was saved or unsaved. It doesn't matter anymore about your pedigree. And it doesn't matter about your fluctuating performance. You can be good one day, bad the next day. You can have a good day, a bad day. You can sin one day, not the other day. I'm not telling you you should sin. But, but this covenant's not based on pedigree or performance. It's based on one thing, my position in Christ Amen. Jesus. Come on. Come on, give the Lord a hand. God has chosen in this covenant age to see us through the life of his perfect son. Yeah. I wrote a book called The Gospel According to Noah. It's a confusing title to some, but I, I guess I chose it because I wanted people to see that the gospel, the new creation gospel is encapsulated in the story of Noah in such a profound way. 
I wrote in, that, in my book that, that Noah is the first baby born after Adam dies in the line of Adam. So if you study the line of Adam to Christ, Noah is born in that line. He's the first one born after Adam dies. Now that's really important to understand because God is showing us a picture here. Adam, the first Adam, is the picture of our fallen nature. And when that nature died, right, when that was put to the cross, Noah was born, which is the new creation man. So everything about Noah is a picture of every believer that is in Christ Jesus. So when our old nature dies, something is born anew. So when you died with Christ, when you asked Jesus to come into your life, when your sins were buried, when you were forgiven and born again and made a new creation, what happens in Noah is a picture of what is happening in your life. Do you get that? Yeah. So we see with Noah's ark, it's, a, it's an ark that's made out of wood, which is a picture of our fallen humanity. So God calls Noah, make me an ark. So, so what Noah builds in the physical is what God has built in you when you're born again. So everything about the ark is a picture of the new creation reality. Are you getting this? So Noah's, he's born and then he builds something. God is building something in you the moment you're born again. So this ark is a picture of your life. The ark is made of wood and wood is the picture of your humanity, the fact that you're living and breathing on the earth. And God says to Noah to cover the ark with tar on the outside and the inside. The word for tar in, in Genesis is the same word for the mercy seat. So he's saying to, to Noah that I'm going to cover your life the moment you're born again with the mercy seat on the outside and on the inside. On the outside to show you that whenever I look at you and your fluctuating performance, I'm going to see it through the blood of my perfect son. Okay. So that's the whole thing about righteousness. God's not looking at your behavior. Now, of course, we want to live right. And, and there's things we'll talk about down the track. But, but your, your assurance, your confidence before God is based on what God is seeing, not what you're, you are doing. God is looking through the blood and he doesn't see your fallen humanity. So that gives me confidence to come into his presence. And when I look out up, I'm not seeing my humanity because the tower is both on the outside and it's on the inside. On the outside for God to see and on the inside for me to see. Remember, there's three questions we need to ask. What is God seeing? What does the devil do about what God sees? And what will I do with what God sees? And so I'm going to be in agreement with God. God's saying, I only see you through the blood and I'm on the inside. My spirit is saying, I only see my life through the blood as well. Amen. 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 The mercy seat was placed in the Holy of Holies. And many of you know the story that God commanded the blood to be placed on the mercy seat. So when God looked at Israel, he would see them through the blood. And every year the blood was shed. And it was a picture of what was about to take place in the sacrifice of Jesus. So Israel then, after the blood was applied at the mercy seat, could be seen as the perfect, beautiful children of God. What an amazing God we serve, hey? This Old Testament picture pointed to a greater reality, which is Jesus. King David saw this hundreds and hundreds of years before it happened. Romans 4, you may want to turn to that verse 6. David spoke of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from their works. He says, blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. David saw this. He saw a day coming where Jesus would offer up his life, his blood would be shed, and all of your sins would be covered forever, eternally. Amen. See, we get so sin conscious where we need to be Jesus con conscious. Yes, we need to deal with sin and we want to be changed into his image. But the way to be changed is not to focus on the power of my sin, but to focus on the power of the blood of Jesus that washes and cleanses me from sin and delivers me from sin. 
Or else, like I said the other week, we be in the shadow box with an enemy that's not really real. A lot of you live lives of illusion. You're fighting against something that's already killed. So God sees us in a whole different way. He sees us justified. I write again about this in my book, and just very briefly, Romans 4, 5 says that God justifies the ungodly. He didn't compromise. He, the, the punishment was paid by Jesus. And because he paid the price for our sin, we are now justified before God. It occurred the very moment that I put my faith in Jesus. The moment I said, Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. I receive your forgiveness. I receive your sacrifice for me. I want to be made whole. I want to be made new. I want to be in Christ. The moment we ask Jesus into our life, where we believed in our heart and confessed with our mouth, the Bible said at that very moment, for me, I think I was about eight years old. The moment I said yes to Jesus, even though I didn't understand the gospel in its entirety, that moment in heaven, God changed the ledger and I was no longer in the first Adam, in a fallen nature. I was now in the last Adam, in a new nature. I was righteous, pure, forgiven, made holy, perfect forever. And nothing could ever change that. How amazing. At that moment, I'm declared obedient because of my union with Christ Jesus. And God imputes to me the very righteous, perfect nature of Jesus. No matter what. Say with me, no matter what. All of heaven declares this one. It declared it over Keith. This one, the moment he got born again, this is what heaven said. This one here is as perfect and righteous as as Jesus himself. Think about that. You today are as perfect and as righteous and as clean and as holy as Jesus himself because Paul says we are in Christ Jesus. The problem is we see ourselves in a way that God doesn't see us. God only sees us in Christ Jesus. This is the whole point of the the ark. God locks Noah in the ark, safe and secure. Safe and secure. And because the ark is covered in tar, it can't leak. It can't leak. And the water is a picture of judgment and condemnation. All the world is judged, but the ark floats above the water. No leaking, no leaking, no, no, no leaking in any floor. Safe and secure, floating above the ark. Sorry, above the water. There is now, therefore, no condemnation to those that are in the ark, in Christ Jesus. You can't be condemned because you're in Christ. You are not to look at yourself in any other way than in Christ Jesus. The Bible says that you are justified and you are forgiven. Romans 4.8 says, Blessed is the man, and let me say for all the women and the women, (laughs) to whom the Lord shall not. Say shall not. This word shall not is an emphatic negative. In, In other words, it says never ever. Never ever. Not ever. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall never ever impute sin. So he's saying to you, I will never, ever, ever hold your sin against you as long as you live. That's what the Bible says. That's why Paul got run out of towns. That's why the Jews would actually run from town to town to hinder his work. Paul was buffeted by the enemy because the enemy did not want people to know the goodness of the gospel. When I first heard this gospel, I thought it was another gospel. I'd been raised on a steady diet of law and performance. And when I found out how God saw me, it shocked me. Because I had a little bit of sin in my life. God has forgiven me of all my sins forever. 
1 John 1 7 says, The blood of Jesus now provides a constant cleansing for my sin. That word constant cleansing is a con present continuous action. What is Jesus doing in heaven? Well, the Bible says that when he was raised from the dead, he went to heaven and he presented his blood before the throne. And there's, there's a mercy seat in heaven, remember, because what was made on earth is a copy and a pattern for the greater reality in heaven. So Jesus presented his blood, Hebrew says, once and for all time. And that blood now speaks before the Father. And it's not the Father wants to be convinced. It is a united agreement between the Father and the Son. And Jesus said, remember, Father, that this blood that I shed constantly cleanses my people from all of their sin. How is that? And that my righteousness is more than enough to cover and conquer their sin. I think that's amazing. God's always going to relate to me now as if I'm perfect. Because I am. And the good thing about that is that now I can go into his presence with confidence. Even when I've failed and sinned, which we all do. Listen, God's got a plan to get us into victory. And every one of you have sinned. Now, some of you may be a bit righteous and think, well, my sin's not as bad as theirs. But I'm going to show you some things in a minute that will undo that. We need confidence. And it's not a pseudo-confidence. It's not something that mind over matter. This is the confidence that comes from the gospel, that I can go into the presence of the Father every day, even when I have sinned and know that I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Because when I walk into his presence... Frequently speaking, God is seeing the Son, the righteous one. And so I can go into the presence of God and it's in his presence that he transforms me. And that's what I always teach you here, that it's in his presence that transformation occurs. You cannot be transformed with a condemnation mindset. If you think that God is distant from you, you will never ever, ever, ever change. If you think he's mad, ticked off, wanting you to perform, jump hoops, you will never change. The pitch in the boat caused the boat to rise against judgment and give Noah total access to the voice of God in his life. That's how God sees you. Perfect, clean, righteous and holy. The law would say, no, you've got sin in your life, you need to clean yourself up, that God's angry, that God's this, that God... That is not the gospel. That is not the gospel that Paul preached. And he preached it so strongly that the, the, the reply back to him from the, the religious was, well, you're saying that we shall sin, that grace would abound. Yeah. That's how strong he preached that. And of course, he showed us that, no, grace teaches us not to sin, but you can't overcome sin with a heavy dose of insecurity. You overcome sin with a heavy dose of love and security. That's how, you over, that's how you overcome it. So God wants me to see myself in Christ. In Christ. In Christ. Too many people are obsessed with themselves. My behavior, my performance, my friend, there is no way to the Father except through the Son. Did you hear that? No way to the Father but the Son. No way to the Father but the Son. No way to the Father but the Son. And if I was to die right now, I am 100% convinced in my heart. And I'm not going to die, by the way. I've got a sermon to preach. <laughs> if I was to die today, I am convinced in my heart that I would go straight into the presence of the Father and He would receive me with joy and gladness because I am in Christ Jesus. And for him not to accept me would mean he would have to reject his son. Wow. And he says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Yeah. Yeah. And the father's well pleased with everyone that's in the son. So that's how the father sees us. And isn't that amazing? Yeah. And look, some of you have come from, and I've come from areas where there's been bondage and brokenness and sin and shame. We've all had our heavy dose of sin. Yeah. But it's not our pedigree and it's not our performance, but it's our position that matters. Now the devil, say boo. boo. 
Thank you. I like it. You did a good boo. Now the devil wants to veil the truth of our true position, whether it's for the unbeliever or the believer. So God wants us to see out the truth of our position. The devil, what does he do? How does he respond to what God shows? He tries to veil so we can't see the truth. So if you're having trouble seeing yourself as God sees you, whether you're saved or unsaved, when you hear my voice, it's for this one reason. The devil wants to blind your eyes to the truth. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 says, If our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so they would not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. What's Paul saying? The devil doesn't want mankind to see who they are. So he puts a veil over their eyes to cover the truth of their identity and their position. So two things he does. You ready? He veils the power of the law to the unbeliever. He says, if you were bad, you wouldn't do good things. You've seen it with friends, those that don't know the Lord. That there's a degree of self-righteousness. Well, you know, I'm pretty good. You know, it's not like I'm a bad person. I, I, I'm kind. I help old people across the road. I've given money to the Red Cross. And, you know, whenever there's, when there's uh, telethons for raising money for the children's hospital, I, 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 I put a tip in. I've even given the world vision. There's nothing wrong with me. And that's what the devil does. He wants to veil the truth of their position, of their standing. Revelation 3.15, God says, I know your works. This was preached to the church many times when I was a young kid. You're neither hot nor cold. And because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. And that, I'd come down the front and get saved every week during that sermon. <laughs> it's got nothing to do with a believer. Because you say, I'm rich, I've become wealthy, I have need of nothing. So you need to get on fire for God. Come on, all those that are cold. Where's your passion for Jesus? Jesus. I'm rich, I've become wealthy, I don't need it. This, this passage is to the self-righteous. It's not to the sinner. Being a sin doesn't make Jesus sick. I've told you this many times. Jesus is not allergic to sin. In the Old Testament, you couldn't touch the leper. They'd make you sin, sick. In the, new, in the New Covenant, Jesus touches the leper and he makes them whole. Jesus came to Adam in his sin and covered him. God's not allergic to sin. Just as well, because he'd be allergic to us. What makes Jesus sick, inverted commas, is self-righteousness. Do you know in AD 60 there was an earthquake and Laodicea, along with a number of towns, suffered under this earthquake and many buildings were brought down and structures obliterated. And Rome offered to assist Laodicea with the rebuilding of its city. And they refused and they boasted these words, we have need of nothing. And so they rebuilt their city and uh, they raised funds from their local taxes and they Rebuilt and where they rebuilt, they stamped the buildings with this stamp out of our own resources. The law wants to cover up the reality of my sinful nature, my true identity. Self righteousness says, I have need of nothing, I can live out of my own resources, I don't need God. And and, and, and really, if God's there, he would accept me because I am a good man, I am a good woman. But the law comes to examine every life. And the job of the law, listen, is not for you to obey, it's to condemn you. That's, right. That's the role of the law. The commands of God are there to slice and dice and condemn every man and every woman. 
And it's to make me aware that I am married to Adam. Paul uses this analogy in Romans 7 of a man and a wife. And he says, every human is married to Adam. Adam is a picture, remember, of the fallen nature, the sin nature. See, sin's not the problem in your life. The issue that before God is whether you have the nature of the first Adam or the last, whether you have a sin nature or a righteousness nature. You don't get to heaven because you don't sin or you do sin. You get to heaven because you're in Christ or in Adam. Yeah. That's the issue. Yeah. So the law makes me aware that I have this fallen nature. God uses the commands to reveal to us that we need a saviour. And the only fruit I can bear to a sin nature is sin. If you marry a woman and you have a relationship with her sexually, she will carry the fruit of your seed. Yeah. I mean, it's not rocket science, is it? And Paul's using this analogy. If you are married to a sin nature and everyone is born with this sin nature... All you will bear is fruit to that sin nature. You can wrap it up. You can put a ribbon on the baby's head. You can put a dress on her. You can put lipstick on her. But if you are married to that nature, you're going to bear fruit to that nature. And it's called good works. But if you unwrap it, it's a sin nature at hand. So the world puts pretty dresses and bows and all sorts of things on their works. But the Bible says you are married to a fallen nature, and you bear fruit to that. In Romans 7, 2, you can read that in your own time, but it says, by law, a married woman is bound to this husband as long as he's alive. So as long as the husband and the wife are alive, you are bound to each other. You can't get rid of each other. And if you try and get out, if you try and get another husband, you're an adulterer. So in other words, you can try all the good things, but you're still bound to him. And he's not going to let you leave. It's like a, being married to a miserable man. I just wish he would drop dead. And so Romans 7 says you've got two choices. The only way for this marriage to dissolve is for either the, ma the wife or the husband to die. Yeah? yeah? So either you die or he dies. And Jesus came to save the world so you wouldn't die. Yeah? Yeah? And so he doesn't want you to die. So the only way around it is to somehow get the husband to die. And that husband had been on earth for thousands of years. So Jesus comes in the place of that husband and becomes the Adam. And he takes that fallen nature to the cross and he puts it to death. And Romans says, now you are free from that law because the purpose of the law is to show you who you are married to. Yeah? Yeah. See, I've got a ring here today and it reveals to everyone, I belong to somebody. I have a wedding certificate to say who that person is. And as long as that wedding certificate is current and the ring is on my finger, I am bound by law to a woman. Praise the Lord for that. <laughs> but it's the same thing spiritually. Paul's saying, you're bound to this old nature until one of you die. And Jesus put to death that one on the cross. And now Romans says we're now free to be married to another. The first one we're married to was Christ crucified. The second one we're married to is Christ risen. The first one we're married to is the first Adam. The second one we're married to is the last Adam. The first one we're married to is the old nature. The second one we're married to is the new nature. Amen. And now you're free to bear fruits yeah. to the new nature. So now I'm married to Christ. Yeah? yeah? yeah. So whenever him and I are intimate spiritually together, I'm going to bear fruit. And as long as I, now hear what I'm saying, okay, get the context. As long as I'm in bed, as long as I'm intimate, as long as I am sleeping in the same room as Christ, I'm going to bear fruit. I could sleep in another room and I'm not going to bear a lot of fruit. I'm still married to him. I'm just separated in another room. But if I would sleep with him and dine and read the word and feed and let his seed of the word get in my spirit, I am guaranteed to bear fruit. Amen. What an amazing thought. So the devil uses a veil against the unbeliever. He, he closes their mind to see the truth of their fallen nature. They think, well, there's nothing wrong with me. But there is. If you don't know Jesus, 
And you can hear my voice today, you need to be born again. You need to allow Jesus to take the penalty for your sin and crucify that old nature inside you and be born again. The second thing, we're almost finished, is the devil uses another veil. He veils the mind of the unbeliever to their true position and he veils the mind of the believer to their true position. He's a veiler. He, he, listen, the role of the devil is to stop you seeing who you truly are. And he does it before you're born again and he'll do it after you're born again. He has one job, is to cloak the reality of who you are. To the unbeliever, he says, if you were bad, you wouldn't do good things. There's nothing wrong with you. To the believer, you know what he says? He says, if you were good, you wouldn't do bad things. There's something wrong with you. The unbeliever, he's always saying there's nothing wrong with you. To the believer, he is always saying there's something wrong with you. Yeah? To the unbeliever, you're, you're wonderful. You don't need God. You're perfect. There's nothing wrong with you. To the believer, that you're always making mistakes. God is always angry. There's always so many problems in your life. There's something wrong with you. And if you were really good, if you really were a believer, you wouldn't do anything bad. And over here you're saying to the unbeliever, if you were really bad, you wouldn't do good things. And over here you're saying, if you're really good, you wouldn't do bad things. Yeah. <laughs> you can't win. Yeah. And that's why he's a liar and a deceiver. Yeah. And that's why we say boo. boo. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> why should we give him any glory? And to the believer, he uses a veil... And the veil is two things, performance and condemnation. Work harder. Strive to overcome. Work, work, work. Come on, God's not happy with you. You better work a bit harder. You need to read more of the Bible. Not that he wants you to read it. He just wants to condemn you for not reading enough. If you read one chapter, you should read two. If you read two, you should read four. If you walk someone over the road, you should walk ten people over the road. It's never enough performance. He wants to veil the fact that you are accepted in Christ Jesus because of what Jesus did, not because of what you did. That's the foundation like the pot I have with rhubarb. If you don't get that right, you can't bear fruit. And we all want to bear fruit of righteousness, to, to be more like Jesus, to overcome sin. Of course we do. But if you don't get the foundation right, nothing works. I told you before that I grew up in a culture where people would take communion one week and not the next. And I thought, what? Was there something wrong with the communion this week? You know, someone poisoned the communion because half the church aren't taking it this week. And I realized as I got older, it's because every second week somebody had done something wrong and they no longer felt worthy to take the blood and the, and, and the bre bread. And so there'd be communion left over because half the church felt condemned because yeah. they didn't understand how God sees them. And the devil had them on this performance track. Nobody is made right. Nobody is accepted. No one should ever have any confidence before God based on your work. Not of works lest any man should boast. And if you think for one minute, you can come before God and say, hey God, listen up. I've nailed it this week. I've read my Bible. I've prayed. I've tithed. I've been nice to my mother. <laughs> and so I know you're going to hear my prayer. Jesus told a parable about that, didn't he? Yeah. Stories like that. About those that came out, look at me. I'm pretty good. And then the sinner comes out, God, just have mercy on me. One comes based on their performance. Lord, you've got to hear me today because I've nailed it. My friend, listen carefully. If you have any more confidence and I have any more confidence to come before God because of the way you've behaved, you are a religious Pharisee. Yeah. Well, that's, that's heavy. But it's true. I, I should have the same confidence even when I have sinned to say, God, here I am, your son. I'm a bit dirty. I've failed this week. And I am sorry about that, but I know that when you look at me, you love me just as much as you did last week when I nailed it. Thank you, Father, that you are so constant. And the Bible says, when my father and my mother forsake me, my father in heaven will never forsake me. 
Never ever. So we need to check our hearts that the moment we think we've got confidence to come before God based on how well we've been, you have taken yourself out of Christ and now you're based on yourself and all the best trying to float without a boat. All the best. How long can you swim in the river of judgment without a boat? Not one human survived outside of the boat. So here's the law. Here's the deal. And I'm just going to shower a couple of things. Here's how the law works. You better obey all of it. So don't tell me, okay, I've got confidence before God because I haven't done that, that, and that, and that. I've not, I've not looked at any pornography. I've not had any adultery this week. I haven't taken any drugs. I haven't sworn. I haven't blasphemed. Okay, so I have confidence. The law says in James 2, if you keep all of the law, but you miss this one, you text in the car while you're driving. <laughs> it says, then you are guilty of all. That's how the law works. Because Jesus is perfect. See, here's what you've got to realize. Father in heaven is absolutely perfect and holy. There's not one skerrick of sin. Just, the, just one drop of vanilla essence. Just one drop of sin. If it gets into heaven, it would, it would be annihilated. Just the, just the smallest thought of anger. That's, that's the standard. That's why Jesus came in the gospel and he lifts the standard. He's saying, okay, you guys think you're holy? I'll just give you a little glimpse of what heaven's like. It's like, oh, God. So you can obey all the law and mess up one out. No confidence. So you can't come to God based on how good you are. You come to God based on how good Jesus is. Yeah, yeah. Come on. <sighs> I've got to buy all of it, and I've got to buy it continually. So Galatians 3.10 says, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do all of the law. So not just stand up for one day. God says, all right, great. You got it right today, tomorrow, one day. Then do it the next, and the next, and the next. But I did 364 days out of the year. No, it doesn't matter. It's got to be continuous. That's why the blood of Jesus continually cleanses me from all sin. And you've got to obey it perfectly. All of it continually, perfectly. So I guess we've shown that this performance trap that the devil puts a veil over our eyes proves to us that it is just so wrong. My position's not on my performance. It's on his performance, his behavior. He's made us perfect. Now I am of the same family. So let me take the veil of performance away from your eyes and say that you can't measure up in your own strength. Jesus measured up for you. And God is satisfied with him. And now that you are in Christ Jesus, he is eternally satisfied with you. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Performance veil, and lastly, condemnation veil. This is what some people struggle with. Are you ready? And here's the revelation. You are just as righteous when you sin and in your sin as you are when you don't sin and aren't in sin. And this reality of your fixed position in Christ Jesus is what empowers you to be free. Here's how it works. If I'm caught in sin, the knowledge that I am loved and forgiven and righteous, and that is not who I am, is what empowers me to change. Yeah. If I'm caught in sin and I think that God is angry, I'm separated, I will continue in a cycle of sin. So when I find people, they tell me they're caught in sin, I don't condemn them. I begin to tell them who they are. It's only an issue of lack of identity. You don't know who you are. Because if you knew who you were, you wouldn't do this. You're not living up to your new nature. And so we begin, and that's how the way, that's, that's prophecy in the new covenant. God calls out the gold in us. God tells us who we are. He doesn't reveal the dirt. We already know the dirt. He reveals the gold. Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, and can I say this? This is a church that Paul planted. 
So it gives us all hope. And he writes to them because some of them... See, Corinth was a city renowned for horrendous sexual activity. Thousands of temple priests would come down from the hill into the town at night and perform all sorts of strange and wonderful acts. Not wonderful, but gross acts. This was the context of this church. They were in a city, a culture, where this was just normal. It was normal for a husband to have relationships with prostitutes and their slaves. This was the environment that Paul raised this church up into. This was going on in his church. So he was writing to a church where the men in the church, some of them were having sex with temple prostitutes. What would you say to them? Right? You do that again and you're out. Don't you know that God's angry? Don't you know it's a terrible, terrible sin? How dare you disgust him when Jesus died on the cross? And the best thing you can do is go down there at night. What about your wives? What about your children? He could have condemned them. You can imagine, I've seen people in past years do things like that. They find people in sin and they berate them and they belittle them. But what does Paul do? 1 Corinthians 6 says, Paul says to them, Hey guys, while you're having sex with this prostitute, you are making Christ one with the prostitute. I'm going somewhere here, so just hang on. While you do this act, Christ is in you. Did you hear that? He hasn't run away. Christ is in you. This is what I'm not writing this, Paul. If you don't believe me, read 1 Corinthians 6. He says, Christ is in you when you do this thing. Then we think, oh, terrible, terrible. That couldn't happen. Well, Christ is in you when you text on the road. Different effect, but the same nature. Did you hear that? Different effect, but the same nature. So we're horrified, oh, sex with a prostitute, and it is terrible. I'm not saying it's not. But see, we're ranking sin again. 10, 9, 8, 7. Yes, the effects are different, but the nature is the same. All sin is rebellion against God. Paul says, Christ is in you. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. It's mind-boggling. What's he doing? Why would he say this? He's reminding them of who they are and the power to help people overcome is to see the truth of their righteousness. That when you do things like that, just understand you do it as a righteous, perfect, holy, pure son and daughter of the living God. And you take God wherever you go, into every decision that you make, you take God with you. And there are... There are there's things that we could talk about as a result of that, but the, what I'm bringing out the context is that Paul's saying, you do not diminish, diminish your righteousness because of your behaviour. There will be an effect, there will be an outcome of your sin, to be sure. But what Paul's saying is, your righteousness is the righteousness of God. Yeah. You are pure, you are holy. So come on, guys, start living the way that you've been made. You're righteous. I say that to people, and I've done that for many years when people are in in addictive behavior. You are righteous. And I want you to do one thing for me. I don't want you to sin. Please do not sin. But if you do find yourself in sin, please do this one thing for me. When When you gain some sort of reason, declare over your life, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It will break the hold of condemnation. It will lead you back to the Father's heart where he can begin to speak to you in love and deal with the issues that brought you into your sin. The Bible says, Awake to righteousness and do not sin. Romans says, In the gospel, righteousness of God is revealed. It's a revelation that we need. We need to awaken to this fact that my position is in him. And out of that, everything flows. Victory over sin, freedom, assurance, constancy. Everything flows out of my position as a fixed, loved son. 
I finish with this verse, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 16. When anyone, sorry, whenever anyone turns to the Lord, listen, the veil is taken away. And so today God's taken away the veil. And it says, and the Lord is the Holy Spirit. And where the Holy Spirit is, there is freedom. God takes away the veil. You see Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit comes and ministers freedom. And we with unveiled faces, we all reflect the glory of the Lord. See, if you have an unveiled face, if you see yourself as God sees you, the Bible says you'll have freedom and you'll begin to reflect the glory of the Lord and be transformed into his likeness from glory to glory, from glory to glory. When I truly see who I am in him and the veil is taken away, even in my brokenness, I begin to see his unrelenting love and his commitment to me. And I behold that I am transformed from glory to glory Amen. to glory. And our goal in this house is to be created and, and shaped and formed into the very same likeness of Jesus. We want to live pure, holy lives. But it begins because I know that my position in Christ is complete. Amen. Thank you.